once in a while. All right. Well, I am really excited about this next session. Um, Intuit is the coolest company that many of you have never heard of. Many of you know QuickBooks, and you know Quicken, and you know TurboTax, but not everybody knows Intuit other than my students because I speak about them with great passion, okay? And we are fortunate enough to have with us Hugh Malazzi, who is the VP of Innovation and Technology at Intuit. Hugh, thanks so much for giving up your Saturday afternoon to be with us. I really appreciate it. So for those of you who may not know Intuit, let me just give you a very quick overview. Uh, Forbes ranks them as one of the most innovative companies on the planet. This guy runs innovation, so he's probably got a little bit to do with that. Um, this is a company that was the first company ever to stare down Bill Gates and win. So while Bill Gates was running his predatory uh, operations, stealing IP from a lot of different companies and getting in a big uh, hassle with the Department of Justice, Intuit took on Bill Gates, Microsoft money, and they kicked his butt. Okay? And that's because a guy named Scott Cook came out of Procter & Gamble, which is a consumer packaged goods company, and he brought world-class marketing skills to tech, which had not been done before. We fast forward, Quicken, 90% of its market. TurboTax, 90% of its market. What do you do for an encore? And so here we have a $4 billion company that maybe, and I'll let Hugh take it from here, you know, hit a somewhat uh, typical wall when you get to that level of scale in terms of innovation agility, and went through a very transformative experience. And for my MBA students, I think one of the coolest videos I've shown you this year is the video of Brad Smith, the CEO of Intuit, uh, describing the transformation of Intuit uh, and, and taking on an incredibly uh, disciplined approach. So Hugh, that being said, we'll get into more detail. And, and the thing about Hugh is he's spent 18 years in Intuit. He's a perfect person for our event. He comes from Zambia. He wound up in the technology mecca of all technology meccas, Mississippi to do his undergraduate degree. And he brought those great tech skills from Mississippi to Santa Clara University where he got his master's in computer engineering. Um, so he has lived the Silicon Valley lifestyle for 18 years, and he was the first and only Intuit employee to win the $1 million Founders Prize for Innovation. So Hugh, that's an incredible achievement. Congratulations. Awesome. So Hugh, take us quickly through your 18-year career trajectory at Intuit. How did you get to where you are right now? Yeah, so the, the program says I've been at Intuit uh, 18 years. It's actually 20 years. Um, but first of all, I should just say thank you for the uh, privilege of talking to you today. I'm very passionate about the work we do at Intuit, and I'm also very passionate about innovation. So I'm a lucky guy to have that be part of my day, uh, what I do every day at work. So I, I came to Intuit 20 years ago. I was a, uh, just to let you know how long ago that was, I was hired as a software engineer to work on QuickBooks for DOS. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Your dating is <laughs> So those of you not laughing don't even know what DOS is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, one of our big franchises is QuickBooks. Um, we, uh, as a company, we see our mission is to uh, revolutionize our customers' financial lives, get them to have better money outcomes. And QuickBooks is, uh, serves a big uh, part of our base, which are small businesses, and helping them run efficiently and be uh, more productive. And so one of the things very early in my time at Intuit, I personally became very passionate about that, this notion that uh, you know, if we do our job well, then there are more small businesses that can thrive, can give jobs to more employees, or even the simple notion that a uh, small business owner, instead of uh, going home at 11 o'clock because they have to deal with all the uh, back office tasks after they close shop, they can actually go home at a decent hour, 6 o'clock, and be with their family. So that's the mission that we have in the company. Uh, and for me, it's uh, an important way to, to spend, it felt like a worthy way to spend one's career. Hence, I've been there a long time. Um, but So I've worked on, I've worked on lots of different versions of QuickBooks as an engineer. Um, I got an opportunity um, to work on a few products from the ground up, um, and I found I had a, a liking to that, and so I, in the company, established this niche for myself as a 
new products uh, uh, innovation person. Uh, one of the products uh, that I helped uh, create was uh, our payments uh, offering, um, of which Mike uh, mentioned I, I, I was uh, uh, rewarded uh, quite generously by the company uh, for that becoming one of our big uh, core businesses today. Um, so I've spent most of my career into it in the small business, but the last two years, this uh, uh, role that I've been in is really an innovation role of how can we accelerate into its journey to be a what we call a premier innovative growth company. You know, we want to be known um, not just to a few people like Mike, <laughs> but we want to be known uh, across the world as a company that is a leader in innovation. And uh, you know, our CEO Brad Smith has made that one of our big priorities. And so we, uh, uh, in making that happen, we seek inspiration from the outside uh, in terms of ideas, new ways of working. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about Eric Ries and the Lean Startup, but it's very typical how we'll find things like that and then try and incorporate that into our culture. But the most important thing I'll say about Intuit is we see ourselves as an 8,000 person startup. We, we, we want that startup mentality and also, you know, the, when it comes to innovation, we don't look at it as there's some privileged few or a few geniuses who get to innovate. We see innovation as the job of everyone in the company. That's why for us it's so important that we can, again, be inspired from the outside, bring it in, teach people ways uh, in which they can uh, themselves be effective and innovators. And to the extent we do that well, we know we'll, be, uh, we'll continue to be a fast-growing company uh, long into the future. That's great. So Hugh, I love your um, <laughs> anecdote about how you, know, you, you really get a lot of personal satisfaction from making sure that the small business owner can live a full life. Right? And one of the things that I tell my students Professor Mike, what should I do? I said, tap into your passion, right? If you can't find a market that you're not enthusiastic about, excited about, um, don't, don't bother because it's just way too hard. So the fact that you were fed by that mission <coughs> says everything to me about why you've been there, why you've thrived. So you're now in this role, which is sort of VP of Innovation Technology, and you're responsible for the unique dual hybrid of you know, ongoing innovation of existing products, but also new initiatives, right? And there's this inherent conflict, and I think I mentioned my favorite quote, Bob Nardelli, who came this close to replacing Jack Welch and then wound up going to uh, Home Depot. There's a fine line between insubordination and entrepreneurship. How do you manage the existing products versus all the people that are looking to bring the new innovations? How do you balance that? That's a really tough thing to do. Yeah, it is an absolutely tough thing to do. You know, our, our previous CEO uh, introduced the concept called True North uh, at Intuit. And, and what it basically says is, you know, for every single employee, uh, it's your job to balance both short and long term across three stakeholders, employees, customers, and shareholders. Um, and, and the reason he said that is that you know, nobody gets the luxury of saying, you know, I just worry about customers. You know, I don't worry about the business stuff. Or somebody saying, you know, I just have to worry about next quarter's earnings and you know, somebody else has to figure out the long term. We all have to think about our jobs, how we're balancing that. But Mike, as you said, it's, it's, it's very hard and uh, you know, I'd say even at Intuit, in spite of us explicitly uh, having this aspiration that we balance, uh, you know, we often find that uh, we, we sacrifice so that we can meet our shareholder expectations, the street, um, uh, sometimes at the cost of things we know would be good for the long term. But I would say ultimately, you know, it comes down to good portfolio management. At Intuit we have, um, there was a notion uh, introduced by Jeffrey Moore, he wrote an article uh, on horizon planning a few years back. And again, in the spirit of being inspired from the outside, we introduced that at Intuit. So uh, horizon planning basically says you, you divide your portfolio into H1s, H2s, H3s. H1s are your core businesses, H2 are your emerging products, and H3 are your um, new ideas, your new concepts. Um, and uh, making sure that your portfolio is balanced and healthy. Um, and that's what we aspire to do. And uh, uh, again, it's, it's, as you say, it's hard, but I, I would say what helps us is that everybody is, uh, is, is educated and everybody understands we need to solve for it. So the three horizons and the alchemy of growth are both at a former colleague at McKinsey Group. Um, and I've shared some of that with my students as well. And, and in the Brad Smith video, we talked about the treasure hunters, you know, and, and, and I think he does an extraordinary job of sort of very visibly painting the, the personalities that thrive in each of those. And I, a thing I always try to communicate.
communicate to my students that self-awareness is so important. You know, are you the person that wants to be the first person on the beach? Or would you prefer to be in a high growth business where there's a lot of certainty and it's just accelerating once the recipe's down? So I think that those guiding principles seem to have really been profoundly powerful for it to me, right? But there's the famous story of Eric Ries being uh, called, Eric Ries being the, the author and now the famous speaker uh, of the Lean Startup methodology and has become a global phenomenon. Uh, and he reached out to Scott Cook, and, or Scott Cook reached out to him, and he said, you're a big company, you know, we have nothing to talk about. And yet, Reese came in, and by the time that meeting was over, um, it looks like there was a real meeting of the mind. So can you take us through, from a, a bird's eye point of view, how that transformation happened, where you've got all these two pizza teams, as, as uh, Brad calls them? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, we, uh, I think the way we first discovered Eric is we found a uh, talk of him on the internet and, uh, you know, he, he seemed like a spiritual brother. Um, haven't said that to him, but the reason is, at Intuit, we already had this notion of uh, what we call design, design for delight, and it's based on design thinking. But there are, three, there are three core principles to it, which is, you know, as you're innovating, the first thing is uh, you want to go broad before you go narrow. You also want to develop deep customer empathy. And then you want to have rapid uh, iteration through experimentation. Um, and so that the, the, the rapid iteration, the rapid experimentation, really um, that resonated what we were hearing from Eric. But I think what Eric did well was he really um, decomposed it into a manner which resonated with a lot of people where they could understand better, like this is how you can be effective uh, when you're rapid exper experimentation. <coughs> you know, again, the whole idea here is that you don't want to make the web ban mistake. You know, again, to date myself, where you invest uh, billions of dollars into an idea only to find out at the end of the day, actually, if you just ask customers, maybe they found out they, wouldn't, they didn't want it. Iridium, that's right. And so the point is, um, if you, on the other hand, and I heard one of the speakers say this as well, if you can find out early whether or not customers uh, are interested in what, you're, uh, what you want to build, then you're better served, and you can also, of course, pivot uh, or you can refine your idea based on that customer feedback. And so the thing that Eric Ries did really well was really talk about how you can take any idea, decompose it into leap of faith assumptions, and then you can test those, sometimes very, very cheaply. Sometimes in the very same, the very same day you came up with the idea. And just building that discipline means that we get much, much better at uh, making sure that the resources that we invest uh, uh, behind our offerings are, are, are resources we spend wisely. And when something is still a concept, you know, this notion of the pizza team uh, is, really, is, is really powerful because those are the times you want to be small and scrappy. I mean, that's been our journey. Um, you know, I always say it's, it's kind of like you're in a uh, rowboat and uh, you're out there in choppy waters, but you want to make, be able to make uh, course corrections very quickly. When you're in a cruise ship, you know, it can take you hours to uh, make maneuver a turn. And uh, that's not the right uh, type of team to have when you're pursuing something which at that time is still, uh, you know, fairly uh, questionable, uh, a lot of question, you know, a lot of risk uh, and ambiguity to it. So on that note, um, one of your colleagues, Alison Newton, who I was for, uh, fortunate enough to do a similar to Fireside Chat with in Boston, um, real dynamo, talked about this one app that was developed for use in India by farmers to make sure that they were able to get the best prices for their output. How do you use Lean Startup to target global opportunities in a way that's maybe a little bit quicker, a little bit more effective, and maybe that is one of many examples you can share? Yeah, no, this, the, the, the fossil story is one, is a great story, is one of the ones that I'm very proud of at Intuit. Um, you know, the first thing again to understand, I, I mentioned at Intuit, we say every employee is uh, asked to be an innovator. And uh, we have an office uh, in India which are, has uh, almost 800 employees today. Uh, but one of the, the one of the programs we have in the company that's been really helpful to us is called Unstructured Time. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, Google's 20% time, it's very similar to that. And the whole idea there is that you give employees time that they are free to pursue whatever passion they have to help drive into its growth. Um, so think again about this unstructured time and people can um, choose uh, you know, fairly radical wild ideas but we, we empower them to do that. Well there was a small group in, in India 
um, who were very passionate about a particular problem. You know, in India you have uh, families, uh, these rural farmers who live off the land, they live off the crops that they plant every year. Uh, many of them have to borrow money, you know, to buy seed, to buy fertilizer, sometimes to rent the land that they grow on. And sometimes at the end of the season after harvest, they find that uh, they haven't made enough money to live. Or maybe they haven't even made enough money to pay back their debts. And so they get so desperate, they commit suicide. Uh, and this is uh, quite uh, rampant, uh, especially around the south of India. So these employees were very passionate to say, what can we do to help these farmers? And so the idea they came up with was, you know, these farmers have mobile devices now. These tend to be feature phones, not smartphones. I wonder if there's a way we could send them a message to let them know, hey, if you have a certain crop, go to this particular market and you will get the best price. And so that was the idea. And then in the, the spirit of Lean Startup, they didn't build up this whole infrastructure. They, they started it with uh, just having employees go to markets, have prices, and then having somebody actually send text messages. Um, and what they found out very early, again, rapid experimentation, that the idea did have a lot of merit, and so they started to build it up. And so today, uh, uh, Fossil is serving over a million farmers in India. Uh, again, it's delivered through text messaging. You know, the way you sign up as, as a farmer is you call uh, into it it's a, as a missed call, that's how you register your number. Uh, it's very important that we have the service be free to customers, so even the cost of a call, we have to think about. But what we're seeing is that farmers are on average getting 20% more revenue from their crops than farmers who are not using fossil. And so they're very passionate. But I think the story that you take away from there is, I'm a big believer in, again, empowering grassroots innovation, and this, when it comes to global, you know, somebody was making the point that it's so important to be in the country that you're in. Um, I think uh, a lot of times, especially in our business, maybe it's not as true in other businesses, but in ours, where again, we are solving for better financial outcomes for people. You know, our fields tend to be accounting, tax, payroll. You know, those are so different from country to country. Uh, we don't want to fool ourselves that we can build a solution here in the Silicon Valley and it'll work all over the world. And so the fact that we had employees in India who were passionate about a problem, um, that to me was the key to making that global solution. The thing that, I think you've used the word empathy at least three times, right? And again, today, you know, design thinking is a very uh, popular discipline. But for those of us who know what DOS stands for, um, empathy was the antithesis of the way that most technology products were developed. It was the, you know, the ivory tower, we know better than you. I actually worked with the CTO who was famous for saying, our customers are stupid, and he literally believed it, right? But we're sitting here today in the world where consumer tech is driving enterprise tech away. And we're looking at everything from the implementation of the iPad everywhere to uh, Dropbox being used as file server in the enterprise, and Dropbox is now providing tools to allow people to understand employee usage. It's just everywhere. Samsung is on fire, and they're now taking their consumer experience into the enterprise as well. Um, you guys were way ahead of the pack, right? Scott Cook, again, using his P&G brand management experience, was 25 years ahead of the pack. One would think you'd have a real advantage right now going into the enterprise. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but anything that you can share about what plans you may have ahead? Because there's something really powerful there. Yeah, I mean, just to expound a little bit on what you were mentioning about the history. You know, 20 years ago when I started working in this industry, um, if you built software that was hard to use and you gave it to a customer, um, and this year in two we have usability labs, you know, you'd have the person there, you know, apologizing profusely about how dumb they are. Exactly. Um, because they just figured they weren't smart enough to use the software. Um, I'm happy to say today uh, people get the fact that actually software should be easy to use, and so they're, they're not as kind and often will say, this, this software is dumb and stupid, so we get the, we, we, we get the burden. And I think um, if you look at the industry, when part of Intuit's success was we recognized that software should be simple and easy and that people should be able to get it and you don't need an advanced degree to use our software. Uh, today, I think everybody understands that, that that's, that's not rocket science. Um, but I think one of the big differences, differences between, as you say, enterprise software and software for consumers is that, uh, again, with enterprise software, typically, um, it's not built necessarily with the user in mind, 
and uh, often they're, they're solving for whatever enterprise processes that that software um, is implementing. And they, and they have a budget for training people up, up to speed. And that's one of the reasons why it's usually very hard to take an enterprise, software that was built for an enterprise, and try and bring it down to consumers. It's just not built the right way. But um, I would also say there are challenges, again, with uh, uh, taking consumer or small business software and trying to go, have it go up the ladder, just because, uh, again, enterprises, they tend to have uh, very specific processes they, they want customized for and you know one size all fit solutions uh, typically don't work. Now having said that, I think uh, one of the opportunities we see is, um, I've, I've heard it referred to sometimes as Enterprise 2.0, this notion that uh, now enterprise software is more likely to be bought uh, in the same way that consumer software is bought, that you would discover perhaps something like a survey monkey and then start using it in the enterprise um, versus uh, the CIO is what software for you to use. And so we think that there are, you know, without saying a lot about what we're doing there, we think there are opportunities for us there. We already have, uh, you mentioned Alison Manukin, she manages our QuickBase business. And QuickBase um, is used primarily by enterprise users, but the, the people who buy it tend to be in work groups. So I may have a team of 50 people looking for a solution and we say, hey, QuickBase will work great for us. And why we think that that's a good opportunity point to it is a work group actually has a lot of similarities to a small business in terms of size and complexity. So, um, so that, those are the type of areas that we're looking to take advantage of. We're going to run out of time. One last question. We kind of broached it on the break. But a lot of times, so I'm, the, I'm fortunate enough to be the global discipline lead for HALT's innovation entrepreneurship curriculum around the world. My students who are here in San Francisco made a very deliberate decision to be here because they want to be at the center of the innovation ecosystem. Now, many of them do not bring technical backgrounds, and, and one of the things I've encouraged them to do is learn how to code. Not to be coders because they're going to make a living coding, but you can't manage people that develop software if you haven't learned how to develop yourself. You can't manage anybody if you haven't done something in that realm. All of a sudden, these immersive coding academies are popping up all over the valley and all over the world, and I realize it's early. Um, but tell me what you, tell the group what you told me about your, the people that aspire to be product managers, which is a very legitimate uh, entry-level position for many of the whole students in the room. It's a great opportunity to really get a direct level of responsibility for a new product. What, what are you telling your, your people within Intuit about that? Yeah, one of the groups that I manage, uh, the company, is called the Rotational Development Program. Uh, what that program is, is we uh, hire kids who have just graduated from college and it's a two-year program, and we rotate them through different groups and different uh, functions throughout the company. Uh, the idea that at the end of two years, you have a more well-rounded employee. Um, and so the, the, the rotational development program has multiple tracks. One of them is product management. Um, and as you were saying, you know, we, we we're moving towards this notion of small, uh, you know, two pizza teams. That's no team should be bigger than, uh, that, than uh, a team that uh, two pizzas would not satisfy. Um, and, and so what, the, what some of the, the folks in our program have been learning is that hey, if I'm working in a small team, I need to be able to roll up my sleeves and help and do the work. And if I, uh, um, uh, if I don't have any uh, technical skills, it's, it's very difficult for me to con contribute. So a few of them have, uh, by themselves, their own initiative, have, uh, have gone out and uh, learned some technical skills and they've found it to be very helpful to them. At the very least, you can actually participate in a conversation. You know, it's rather than tune out when it becomes very technical, you can actually start contributing and uh, even offer some uh, solutions, alternatives. That's great. So, for those students in the room here, uh, again, very international group, very innovative focused. You know, there's no question. I love your uh, tagline, your 8,000 person start. Right? Not everybody here is ready for or has the appetite for being in a startup. So the good news is whether it be IBM, whether it be EMC, Stephen, good to see you, Intuit, there's more and more opportunity for corporate catalysts in large organizations today. Somebody coming into Intuit from an MBA program with a global background and not an engineering undergrad degree, what kind of advice would you give them about how they might, you know, thrive in an environment like Intuit? Yeah, you know, one of the things you already mentioned is, uh, you know, what are you passionate about? Um, I, you know, again, hopefully, um, you can articulate that in a way and find a role in the, in the 
even in a large corporation where you can drive change. And I always say that I tell people that I mentor that the most valuable people in the company are the ones who are driving change. You know, if you come in and you just fit in uh, like a piece of machinery, um, uh, you might con contribute, but you're maybe not contributing at the level of those who are driving change. So come in with this mindset to drive change. And for a company like Intuit, and it's true for a lot of other companies, you know, we have big successful franchises, so we make a lot of revenue. <coughs> nice thing about the software business, we have uh, uh, good uh, uh, margins, uh, but the, our big challenge is growth. And so what you'll find is that we have our aspirations to look for new businesses, uh, find new ways, new, you know, new, new uh, markets, um, going global, and you'll find that it's not as different as the ambitions that startups have. And so I think if you have those aspirations, you'll find, uh, and you again, you're passionate about it, you'll find a way to make a big difference. Hugh, I really enjoy getting to know you. Appreciate the insights. Everybody, great, warm welcome in hand for two minutes. Hugh, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Appreciate it. Uh,